Forgiveness. It's one of the oldest concepts known to man. We learn about forgiveness when we're just children. I have two kids, a three-year-old and an eight-year-old. And if I had a dollar for every time I asked one of them to say sorry to the other one, I would be absolutely rich. But beyond that, what am I teaching my children about forgiveness? Furthermore, what have I taught myself about forgiveness? In order to share with you what I know about forgiveness, I have to take you back about 20 years. Back to 2002, when I was about 12 years old. I was with my best friend, who was a couple years younger than me. And together, we were in the little town that we grew up in, called Augusta, Montana. It was the middle of the night. It was pitch black out. And my best friend and I were running. We were running down a dark alleyway. This alleyway led to a big white and red house on Main Street. And this house was important to us. Because in this little town that we lived in, there was only one law enforcement officer, the Lewis and Clark County Sheriff's deputy, and he lived in that white and red house. On this night, we were being chased down an alleyway by my stepfather. We were on our way to the big white and red house to turn him in to authorities. I'm a victim of childhood sexual abuse. I was born on the Blackfeet Reservation here in Montana. Unfortunately, I wasn't alone in my abuse. My best friends, I would invite them over to have sleepovers at my house like any normal little girl would. And unfortunately, my stepfather would molest them as well. But on this night in 2002, something was different. My best friend and I were sexually abused, but this time we were angry. This time we were done telling my mom. This time we were going to go to the cops. As soon as my stepfather caught wind of what we were doing, he jumped up out of his chair and began to chase us down the driveway. This was the scariest night of my entire life. I remember everything about it. I remember the sound of the gravel beneath my shoes. I remember exactly what I was wearing. And I remember exactly how confused the deputy's wife looked when she answered her back door and found two young girls standing there. We explained to her what we were doing. We explained that we thought we were still being chased. And she went inside and got a cordless phone. She came back. And she said, in order for us to move forward, we would need to call the 911 dispatcher and report what we were doing there. So we did that. We explained to the dispatcher over the phone that we were there to turn my stepfather into the police for sexually abusing us. She allowed us to come inside, and there we waited for the deputy to come downstairs. He came downstairs and he was wearing his full uniform and he had his gun belt on and his pepper spray and his handcuffs. And I remember vividly thinking in my young mind, wow, this is a really good cop. He sleeps in his uniform. <laughs> that way he's ready for crimes to happen. So he asked us to sit down and fill out police report forms. So together, my friend and I sat down and filled out these forms with our stories. That was when my friend's parents came to pick her up and take her home. She gave me a big hug. She told me everything was going to be okay, and she went home. That was when it was time to figure out what was going to happen to me. The deputy explained that he had spoken to my mom over the phone and that she was going to be supporting my stepfather through this. She told, she told him that she no longer wanted anything to do with me. The deputy called my immediate family members in the area, in the towns of Fairfield and Shoto, and they said that they didn't want anything to do with family drama. So he explained to me that what was going to happen next was going to be difficult. He said, there's no place left for me to go except for a children's shelter in Helena, which was about 85 miles away. And right as the sun came up, the cruiser pulled up in front of the big white and red house. And I remember just wishing I could ride shotgun, but I couldn't. The police officer placed me in the back seat 
on the cold, hard plastic. And it was at that moment that any sense of triumph or victory that I had went out the window. I was the one in trouble. My stepfather was never charged or convicted. He was only made to do community-based sex offender treatment, and he was never placed on the registry. So I rode to Helena in the back seat of the police car and arrived at the children's shelter there. And I remained there for a number of days until the Department of Family Services could complete a background check on my real dad, who lived in northwestern Montana. So eventually, my dad was finally able to come and pick me up and take me home. Immediately after this, I went into this mode of being completely ignorant to what I had been through. Sexual assault is very shameful. It makes, it, it makes you feel like it's your fault. And I didn't want to feel like that, and so I just pretended like nothing happened. I did well in school. I graduated high school, and I decided I was going to go to Alaska to go to college. And I did that. I wanted to be an air traffic controller. But before I knew it, my trauma was starting to present itself in some really scary ways. I had never received mental health treatment, so I didn't know what was going on. But before I knew it, my life was spiraling downward. I was using drugs. I dropped out of college. It was time to come home. So in 2010, I got on a plane and I flew home to Montana. And while I quit doing drugs, I switched drugs for alcohol and I started drinking heavily. And I continued to drink and I continued to drink. I had reestablished contact with my mom. We were constantly fighting. Our relationship was so turbulent, but that was my mom, right? I'd always been taught that I needed to forgive. But here's the thing, is truthfully, I hadn't really forgiven her at all. When I got back to Montana, I was driving down Highway 93, the same highway that all of you will pull out onto when we leave here. I was driving down the road in the middle of the night. My windows were down, my hair was blowing through the wind. I'm sure I had some loud music playing, not a care in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to be arrested for driving under the influence. In the state of Montana, when you're arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol, you're required to complete what is called a chemical dependency evaluation. And this basically means that you sit down with a mental health professional and you go over your crimes and your traumas and you make a determination on what level of care you would like to receive, or they think you should receive. For me, it was determined that I needed to attend inpatient treatment. And so a couple weeks later, I was in Butte, Montana, and I checked myself into the Montana Chemical Dependency Center. At the Montana Chemical Dependency Center, I learned about healthy ways to deal with my trauma, coping skills. I learned about emotional regulation, I also learned the importance of self-care. This was the first time that I had ever been given the opportunity to have mental health care, uh, professional and qualified. It was the first time and, and I had never actually sat down and told my story to someone like this. So I told my story to my counselor and I remember so vividly, she said, Tara, this is gonna sound like I'm being really mean but the relationship that you're trying to have with your mom, it's sick. And I didn't want to believe her at first. No, that's my mom. I wanted my mom in my life. But as I would learn, my counselor was right. I didn't listen to my counselor, and I decided that I was going to go visit my mom over in Augusta in the same house that she lives in, and uh, her husband as well. I went to go visit her, and as I walked inside her house, I discovered that there was a 12-year-old little girl having a sleepover at their house. That did not sit well with me. I got angry. 
I went home and I decided I was going to use my voice for a second time, but this time I was going to tell the world. So I sat down in front of my laptop and I made a video and I recorded my story just as I'm telling you here today. And I decided to use the power of social media. I uploaded the video onto the internet and the, um, the response was immediate. It grabbed everyone's attention. And before I knew it, I was telling my story to schools and prisons. But I wouldn't have been able to do this without my understanding of forgiveness. While I was in treatment, I was given reading where I was supposed to research forgiveness. And that I learned so much. First off, I learned two things. Forgiveness does not mean condoning. Second, forgiveness does not mean revisiting. And third, I learned that forgiveness doesn't have just one definition. There are multiple types of forgiveness and I believe that understanding them can empower a victim. The first type of forgiveness is full forgiveness, also known as exoneration. And this is the top level of forgiveness. And while forgiveness, full forgiveness can be set as a goal, as it is healthy, it's not always possible. In cases of childhood sexual abuse or even just sexual assault, you will usually find a victim who has a hard time forgiving. Please don't expect full forgiveness from everyone. The next type of forgiveness is called conditional forgiveness, also known as forbearance. Conditional forgiveness means that you're putting the relationship on probation. The relationship is important to the victim and they're going to move forward without feelings of revenge or resentment. And the beautiful thing about conditional forgiveness is that after time, trust can be rebuilt and it can morph into full forgiveness. And I think that's really beautiful. The third type of forgiveness is called false forgiveness, and this one is not healthy. And this is where I was stuck with my mom. I had convinced myself that I had forgiven her, but in reality, I didn't. And how did I know this? Because I still felt feelings of hate, anger, revenge, and that means that I really didn't forgive. The next is unforgiveness, and this one is the tricky one. It's probably the most common but it's widely agreed upon as being unhealthy. How do you forgive the unforgivable? And without forgiveness, can we still heal? Well, I believe the answer is yes, and that's because of an option called release. With release, you're releasing this person from your life, just as you're releasing your feelings of resentment and vengeance and hate and anger. Forgiving what you can and leaving the rest. I believe that when we approach forgiveness as more of a process with multiple options, we're, we're not backed into a corner. And for me, I was able to begin using my story to empower others. Not only did I start speaking and sharing my story, but I started to lobby Montana's legislature for changes to our laws. Last year, we were able to eliminate Montana's statute of limitations for crimes of sexual abuse. We were also able to extend the civil statute of limitations so that victims have more time to sue their abusers. In 2017, I passed a law, House Bill 298, which aimed to educate Montana's children in public schools about body safety. It was signed in April 2017 and it was named Tara's Law. In this last year, with some help of some amazing lawmakers, we were able to establish the country's very first Sexual Assault Survivors Day right here in Montana. And on April 7th this year, we'll celebrate our first holiday. <laughs> These achievements helped me to give my power back, but I was also able to take my power back in person. With the help of an incredible attorney, I was able to serve my stepfather with a lawsuit. 
To my astonishment, during the only legal deposition that ever occurred, I expected him to lie and say that he had done nothing to me. But to my shock and amazement, this man who towered over me as a child and spent countless nights sneaking into my room on his hands and knees, crumbled before me and admitted to what he had done. Ladies and gentlemen, childhood sexual abuse is very common. One in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually abused before the age of 18. If you're a Native American female baby like me, born on a reservation, your chances increase to one in three. This also means that sexual predators are also very common. And in my story, the actual police officer that my friend and I ran to in the middle of the night was just charged and convicted of sexually abusing children last year, along with child pornography. He'll be sentenced in April in Helena at the federal courthouse. Talk to your kids. The biggest line of defense is educating your kids about body safety. Tell them what to do if something happens to them. Next, if a child comes to you with allegations of childhood sexual abuse, believe them. And finally, choose them. Choose your kids, always. And I wanna leave you with one last thing. There is one person in your story that deserves forgiveness no matter what. Someone who has probably made a lot of mistakes, burned a lot of bridges, probably treated people really badly, or maybe even gotten arrested like me. This one person who deserves your forgiveness, no matter what, is yourself, the survivor of trauma. And I think that is an idea worth sharing. Thank you.